Welcome, thank you for joining us today. My name is David Malone and I'm rector of the United Nations University System, which is really a confederation of research institutes spread throughout the world. We're headquartered in Tokyo and we come to you from Tokyo today with our guest who happens to be a friend, uh, Danilo Turk, uh, who has an extraordinary life experience. Uh, he's an academic by profession, but he's an activist by avocation, and he brought the two together in the field of human rights when he was young and law, because he's a very talented lawyer. Uh, he worked with various dimensions of the UN's complex uh, human rights system, having worked earlier in the NGO world. He taught at university. He became his country, Slovenia's first ambassador to the United Nations in New York in 1992. During the period while he was ambassador, he sat in the Security Council, unusual for a country to be elected to the Security Council so soon after independence, a tribute uh, to him and his country. Uh, he also sat on the Human Rights Committee of the UN, which plays an extremely important adjudicatory role on human rights issues and a normative role which is very important. I don't know how you combined it all, uh, Danilo. In the year 2000, he became Assistant Secretary General of the UN for Political Affairs, a huge remit. Uh, essentially, all of the political problems in most of the parts of the world, um, huge job. In 2005, he returned to his country, uh, to uh, the academic world, but only two years later, in 2007, he was elected president of Slovenia, uh, a position in which he served with great distinction until 2012. We're lucky in a way, those of us who study international relations, to have him back in the academic, research, uh, advocacy uh, world. We're delighted to have him at UNU today. We'll be doing a public engagement for which we have a huge crowd signed up a bit later today. But for those of you who can only join us on the website, we did want to spend a few minutes with Danilo. And I wanted to ask him essentially uh, two or three questions. The way the UN, uh, Danilo, seems to organize itself today is around three pillars. One is security, I think most of us do uh, associate the UN with international security. The second one has to do with global development, on which uh, the UN shares the action with many other institutions. Uh, and the third, and this is relatively new, although there were hints of it in the UN Charter, is human rights, where I'd say the growth has been sharpest in recent years, which must give you a lot of satisfaction given your life story. So why don't we start with human rights and how you see the trajectory of the UN on human rights since you st first started working with it, I think in 1975. Yes. Well, if I look back in the period since 1975, I can clearly see three distinct uh, phases. Uh, in the first one, between 75 and the end of Cold War, the human rights uh, politics has had a truly transformative effect. That was the time which coincided with the administration of President Jimmy Carter in the United States, with transformations in Latin America, Eastern Europe, eventually South Africa. And by 1990, the world has changed. And in the basis of that change was the idea of human rights. All these changes were inspired, were motivated by human rights. Subsequently, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was established in 1993. And of course, that gave an additional institutional force to what the UN was doing in the area and strengthened various bodies that exist in this, uh, in this field. And that created a new need, the Council for Human Rights, which is a strengthened uh, a collective organ of the UN, was established in 2006. And that uh, body really governs the whole process now. 
And if I was asked how I see the current uh, development, I would say, of course, this uh, whole evolution has been quite exuberant. But that brings with it some problems. And these problems are problems of growth. So I think the critical question today is strategic management of the whole set of bodies that exist in the field of human rights. And of course, the need for that management to capture the imagination of people and lead further transformations. Well, I think you identify there a challenge which is also a challenge for the UN in uh, the field of development. There are many development actors in the UN uh, and uh, in effect in the UN as elsewhere, the actors seem to chase the donors. So the actors are prepared to move from one field to another if the donors want to do that. And in the last 20 years, uh, further to the CNN effect of uh, live coverage of terrible humanitarian disasters, we've seen the donors effectively shifting a great deal of their money to humanitarian action creating new actors in that field, some of them NGOs, uh, some uh, intergovernmental. Uh, and I wanted to ask you how you see uh, the world of development and the ro UN's role in it today. Well, first I think one has to get rid of an illusion that the world is facing a major disaster. And I think this um, disaster ideology has been very much a companion of much of the UN discussion on development. But if one looks into the history and the big picture, one can see that the world has improved. And of course, this was not only due to the UN, but UN had two important contributions in that regard. First, it was a major donor in the sense that uh, financing of development has been one of the centerpieces of UN policy and that has produced some results. Of course now with private foreign investment being a much larger part of investing in development, the official development assistance may be relatively less important, but it remains vital because that's a part of the UN uh, purpose uh, in development which uh, can be wisely focused on things that, that, uh, that promote further development. And the other thing which was not less important is conceptualization. Mm. What does development mean? And of course here the UN has made a huge progress between let's say 1960s and 70s when this conceptual debate started for real until now. Uh, we have uh, now the Millennium Development Goals as a set of rather precisely defined objectives in development. There is a sense of priority which is important for any development strategy. This has a strong indirect impact on governments and their policy making. Governments tend to compare one with another. Indicators have been developed. The Human Development Report has developed a comprehensive set of uh, indicators which go far beyond the growth of domestic product, GDP, yeah. uh, and have captured important aspects of social development as well. So the <clears throat> conceptual side and comparative, uh, that's the ability to compare different performances have been a big success of the United Nations. And now there are new ideas coming up. I would like to mention only one, and that is management of data, information that exists in our um, time of uh, information and technologies. Uh, there is a huge amount of data which could be, if, uh, pr if privacy is protected properly, very helpful to governments and international decision makers to focus development policies on most uh, effective points. And that's a big uh, job for the future, which I hope you and will also do. Well, I, I, I think it's beginning to tackle it. One of the challenges with data, of course, is that you can extrapolate all sorts of conclusions from faulty data. So the multiplication of data in and of itself isn't necessarily helpful unless we're pretty sure of its integrity. Uh, it was striking the other day to watch uh, Nigeria's GDP double virtually overnight because it turned out that uh, there had been uh, faults in the methodology of data collection. 
So I think big data provides, as you say, great opportunities, but I think there are also risks in relying excessively on data which we're not entirely certain about. I, well, I agree, of course. Uh, one has to make sure that the methodologies are uh, developing in terms of sophistication. I mean, there are two problems, really. One is availability of mm. data, which is not an easy task in every country of the no. world. OECD countries, for example, have a much better system and their, their availability is at a much higher level. Mm. And then the second one is reliability of data. Now, one should understand that these problems have solutions. Mm and that with the growing uh, sophistication of data gathering, data analysis, and presentation of results, one can really improve uh, the whole methodology of work. I myself, I was involved in early days of human development report uh, on indicators and the leadership of such wise people like uh, Mahbub ul yeah. in the UNDP. And I have seen how much courage was necessary at that time to rely on a proposed system of indicators, which was at that time still relatively rudimentary. But uh, looking in retrospect, one can see that that daring approach paid off. Because now I think uh, all the relevant actors internationally take the results of UNDP, Human Development Reports, seriously. They understand its weaknesses, of course. Mm but they use uh, those reports and indices for a good cause. And that's the way progress is being made. We are never perfect, mm. but we can improve. Absolutely. Now, I wanted to turn to the, the first pillar uh, that I mentioned at the outset that most of us associate the UN with, uh, peace and security. The UN is generally criticized for not being terribly effective on a number of crises. When it's successful, it tends to not attract a great deal of attention. Sometimes it's successful discreetly. Sometimes the public just isn't interested in the crises involved. But uh, there's no doubt that the UN faces a very heavy burden of security-related crises around the globe, particularly in Africa, but not exclusively in Africa. And I wanted to ask you over your many years of looking at international relations, how you would assess the evolution of the UN on security. Well, first of all, in a very general sense, I would say the concept of collective security has expanded over the years. Initially, it was all about the UN and the Security Council. Now we see that various other players, especially regional and sub-regional organizations, have entered the scene in a very big way. So if you, if you look at Africa, which you mentioned, uh, all the crises in Africa require a certain form of involvement of African Union and or sub-regional organizations in Africa. In West Africa, we have known from earlier on that without ECOWAS, no real solution can be found. In uh, East Africa, IGAD plays a similar role or an important role. And today, when one looks for solutions for South Sudan, it is already known that without an IGAT involvement, the countries of yes. that part of Africa, UN will not be able to really be effective. So effectiveness of collective security does not depend on UN alone, UN as an organization, mm -hmm. but on sophisticated cooperation between UN and regional actors, and of course, global players, which always have to be involved in a positive sense if one wants to have a solution. That's one very important lesson. Then over time also, of course, peacekeeping as a trademark activity of the UN has evolved and we have to recognize that there have been improvements, including in countries in Africa where there were real problems and one should criticize the UN for faults which are real. But on the whole, progress has taken place. And finally, let us not forget the convening power of the UN. UN is the organization which is often asked to convene important meetings, the most recent on Syria. They haven't been very successful so far, but they remain the only hope, mm -hmm. because only the UN can bring together all the parties, including the major powers of the world and all the factions in Syria, into a process which, which is the only hope that the war will be stopped and, and a kind of a peace arrangement will be forged at the end. 
Well, I remember early in my time at the UN, uh, the Organization of American States had been working very hard uh, to help Haiti emerge from its crisis of democracy. But eventually it turned to the UN because the Organization of American States uh, under international law could not impose mandatory sanctions. And that was something the UN Security Council could do. So the first recourse wasn't the UN. The first preference of the countries of the Americas was try to try to do the job themselves. But when they couldn't, as you say, the UN has certain powers, including global convening powers, but legal powers as well, that are unique to it. Well, sometimes these powers are quite vital. But mm. if we talk about Haiti, for example, mm. one must understand that sanctions uh, are not, uh, you know, do not produce miracles. Sanctions mm. are sometimes necessary. But sanctions also bring with it problems yeah. which have affected the economic structure of Haiti quite seriously. So one has to find a proper mix of measures and timing of measures. Mm. Sanctions should not stay forever. They should be a temporary measure. And they have to be followed by other means which are more uh, development oriented. And I think in Haiti this lesson was relearned as in many other places. And another thing about the UN and regional actors, you see sometimes it is important to see regional actors also in their evolution. Uh, so Organization of American States is an old organization and it has its advantages uh, and of course its weaknesses. But sometimes it can be regionally complemented by a major player like Brazil. Mm. So when Brazil decides to help the UN with peacekeepers in Haiti, that's a big regional assistance. Yeah. It shouldn't be seen as a purely national policy of yeah. Brazil, it should be seen as a regional engagement, which then further is further strengthened by the admission of Haiti into CARICOM so that it belongs more fully to the sub-regional group of Caribbean states. And that all these elements together create an opportunity to improve the situation. Mm. As we know, Haiti has been a problem for almost two centuries, mm. and therefore one shouldn't expect miracles to happen. But I think that this synergy of a variety of regional uh, factors, like Brazil, like CARICOM, mm. like OAS, and the UN is the way forward. Well, your remarks bring out what a complicated ecology the UN works within as a leading part of, but it works with many other organizations. Civil society has become extremely dynamic within countries, but also internationally. And all of this has actually made international relations a whole lot more interesting uh, than they probably were uh, when we were both starting out. Danilo, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, I'm sorry that we can't bring you tonight's engagement in full, but I hope this will have given you a flavor of the sorts of issues that we discuss at the United Nations University and the caliber of the guests who are kind enough to visit us from time to time. Thank you very much.